That's it for Squawk on the Street, uh, the last one of the week. Thank you for watching. I'm Simon Hobbs. And I'm Melissa Lisi on the Halftime Report. Meantime, the call is up next. We'll leave Simon and Melissa there. There are 30 minutes to the closing bell here in Europe and market shock as the US economy only delivers 18,000 non-farm jobs in June, the jobless rate jumping to 9.2%. European banks are beaten up as details emerge about next week's stress test. That's exactly a week from now. Uh, Italian banks, in particular Unicredit, have once again been at the center of the selling. And B Sky B stock takes another hit as a deal with Murdoch looks far from imminent. This as the British phone hacking scandal continues to escalate despite News Corp's move to shut down the news of the world. This is European Closing Bell with Guy Johnson and Louisa Boyerson. There was one number that defined the session today, and that was the 18,000 we got on non-farm payrolls. This was so below expectation, there was an audible intake of breath around the world as the number came out. The June payroll plus 18,000, but the bad news didn't end there. The revised number for the previous month of May plus 25,000. The jobless rate also jumping back up by 9.2%. We knew that we were in the midst of a soft patch. We knew that the impact of Japan was being felt. It was not expected that it would be felt this hard. That number, a big shock. Let me show you the market reaction. Let me show you what is happening uh, around the, uh, the European continent uh, as the story develops. Uh, we're looking at a, uh, a picture of the White House right now. We're waiting to see what exactly President Obama's thoughts are on what happened here. Uh, but let me show you the heat map. Let me show you exactly what has happened to the European equity story throughout the day. As you can see, it has been a largely negative one. We've only got a slither of green up there. We've got a nine to one ratio in favor of losers today. The market reaction came swiftly, and as you can see, it was dramatic. The move lower in equity markets came soon after that number was announced. We're only down by seven tenths of one percent, but the change in sentiment this afternoon, I would argue, has been quite significant, really just reinforcing concerns that this story is going to be extended uh, and uh, therefore that the uh, the pain is going to be felt for much longer than originally anticipated let me show you what is happening with the uh, equity chips let me show you what's happening with these numbers 59.93 the london market uh, is back below the 6000 level we're down by a full 1% in London. It's the banks that are seeing the selling today. RBS in London, Comets Bank in Frankfurt. The CAC 40 is down with stocks like Agricole uh, and BNP under pressure. The SMI also down by 9 tenths of 1%. But it's Italy. Italy has been the real story today. We'll come on to the bank stress test a little bit later. But it's the banks that have been uh, really causing so many problems for the, uh, the European equity markets as they try and rise uh, over the last few months. Banks down today by 2.27%. Many of the major names that you trade on a regular day-to-day -day basis are down by 4 plus percent today. The numbers are painful. Technology is also trading down by 2%. Uh, we've got basic resources, the big mining stocks trading lower today, media down as well. That story gathering momentum in the UK. So a lot going on today, a very hectic show ahead of you. Plus we've also got, of course, well, what else have we got to talk about, Louisa? Well, Guy, you, you kind of summarized what it is that we're going to feed through for the next uh, hour or so. We need more reaction to the weak jobless numbers uh, across main asset classes. We can't leave out what took place in the currency markets initially, seeing the euro rally ahead of, uh, ahead of the, the, the dollar, excuse me, rally ahead of the jobless figures, and then it dropped back substantially. Uh, also, the stress test results are released, as mentioned. That's exactly a week from now. What should you be aware of, though, ahead of this? What in particular is it that you should be looking out for for next Friday? when those results are released. And David Kuo from The Motley Fool, he's our guest host as well. So send through your emails, European Closing Bell at CNBC.com is the email address. It's on screen right now. Or find me on Twitter at Louisa Boyers and we'll be taking your questions from there as well, Guy. The US curve flattened as a result of the number we saw. Let's get Rick Santelli's, Rick Santelli's take on all of this. This is, feels a little bit more like a, than a soft patch, doesn't it, Rick? Yeah, you know... It, Listen, I, I, now that we have basically for sure two, you could argue three, uh, job numbers that are disappointing, there's a certain reality that's setting in. And it isn't and can't be, in my opinion, explained away by the horrible tsunami and earthquake that happened in Japan in March. It can't be completely explained away by some of the issues you're describing pre-stress test, post what, bailout number two, three, I forget, in terms of Greece. That what we really have is a continuation of all the events that we've been witness to. A housing market that 
really may not have hit bottom, a jobs market where there's structural unemployment that doesn't seem to want to go away. Uh, we pay a lot of money for various programs and strategies that have created a lot of debt that is now the main talking point with the debt ceiling. So I think the markets are, are, are really on top of the notion. Uh, the debt has survived, but the, the jobs that were created were unsustainable. And you're seeing, especially on the government side, just, with just terrible employment figures. Rick, thank you very much indeed. We'll wait to hear what the president has to say on those numbers. Mr. Santelli joining us there from Chicago. Big move on the, uh, the bunt today. In fact, I understand that the U.S. president has just walked out of the White House. He is speaking. Let's listen to what he has to say. The security they deserve. And that means getting back to a place where businesses consistently grow and are hiring, where new jobs and new opportunity are within reach, where middle class families once again know the security and peace of mind they felt slipping away for years now. And today's job report confirms what most Americans already know. We still have a long way to go and a lot of work to do to give people the security and opportunity that they deserve. Uh, we've added more than two million new private sector jobs over the past 16 months. But the recession cost us more than eight million. And that means that we still have a big hole to fill. Each new job that was created last month is good news for the people who are back at work and for the families that they take care of and for the communities that they're a part of. But our economy as a whole just isn't producing nearly enough jobs for everybody who's looking. Uh, we've always known that we'd have ups and downs on our way back from this recession. And over the past few months, the economy's experienced some tough headwinds from natural disasters to spikes in gas prices to state and local budget cuts that have cost tens of thousands of cops and firefighters and teachers their jobs. The problems in Greece and in Europe, along with uncertainty over whether the debt limit here in the United States will be raised, have also made businesses hesitant to invest more aggressively. The economic challenges that we face weren't created overnight and they're not going to be solved overnight. But the American people expect us to act on every single good idea that's out there. I read letter after letter from folks hit hard by this economy. None of them ask for much. Some of them pour their guts out in these letters. And they want me to know that what they're looking for is that we have done everything we can to make sure that they are rewarded when they're living up to their responsibilities, when they're doing right by their communities, when they're playing by the rules. That's what they're looking for. And they feel like the rules have changed. They feel that leaders on Wall Street and in Washington, uh, and believe me, no party is exempt, have let them down. And they wonder if their efforts will ever be reciprocated by their leaders. Uh, they also make sure to point out how much pride and faith they have in this country, that as hard as things might be today, uh, they're positive that things can get better. Uh, and I believe that we can make things better. Uh, how we respond is up to us. There are a few things that we can and should do right now uh, to redouble our efforts on behalf of the American people. Let me give you some examples. Uh, right now, there are over a million construction workers out of work after the housing boom went bust. Just as a lot of America needs rebuilding. We connect the two by investing in rebuilding our roads and our bridges and our railways and our infrastructure. And we could put back to work right now some of those construction workers that lost their jobs when the housing market went bust. Right now, we can give our entrepreneurs to chance, uh, the chance to let their President Obama speaking at the White House following the shocking 18,000K non-farm payroll number we had today, trying to lay out some of the right objectives now. that he has to try and put America back to work. The market reaction, swift today. One of the biggest reactions was in the German tenure, the Bunds. We've now got a 2.8 yield 
on that. A lot of buying into the, uh, the safe havens. Italy again on offer today, yields rising there as Italy increasingly, it seems, becomes one of the main battlegrounds. This is not a peripheral country. Italy cannot be rescued, but yet it is now being increasingly drawn into this story in a rather worrying way. Louisa. Yeah, Gaia, as you indicate, uh, it really did feel like a, a risk-off scenario uh, after that, and it still does after that, an on-farm payroll number. Nick Beecroft, he's a senior markets consultant at Saxo Bank. Risk-off for the time being, and, and maybe QE3 on? <laughs> I think risk-off, certainly. This is... Um, this today's figures probably put to rest the myth that this was a soft patch that the state was going through through the summer due to Japanese supply constraints and the increase in oil. It's turning into a, a long soft patch, put it that way. Yes, one maybe. Uh, the fiscal tightening's on the way, monetary stimulus is being reduced, just QE2 ends, but QE3 is just heavy into view over the horizon, uh, I suspect, uh, and, and it started today. That. Uh, the, the ECB raised rates by 25 basis points yesterday. Mm. Given these numbers, the Fed is not going to be raising any time soon. Indeed, it's going to be quite a long period of time before the Fed raises rates. Mm. Does that put a limit on how far the ECB can go? Um, no, I don't think so. Given the, uh, the, uh, the single mandate that they feel they have to, uh, to keep inflation, uh, inflation close so to 2%. At you don't feel well, that... No, I don't, don't think so, given the structural problems that the euro also faces. Um, and the longer term, that's very possible when the euro has become a union of the stronger countries and is really the Deutsche Mark in disguise, we're talking two, three, four, five years, then yes, the euro could be 170. Uh, and, and the market, you know, the euro is very resilient, isn't it, given that all that's happening. Staggering. Maybe that's why, because the market's already looking through yeah. to those uh, sunny uplands. Yeah, where it's, that's, uh, yeah, that's my theory as well. We're just heading into you know, the next quarter the earnings season. Uh, mm. How much further, though, do, do yields fall? Are people going to switch out of equities and into the bond markets? Well, we've they been fall. talking about a, a three and a quarter to two and a half percent range for 10 years. We got up and nudged three and a quarter in the uh, rather uh, overdone euphoria after last week's votes in Greece. Uh, and now we're heading back to two and a half by the end of the year, I think. More rumours that Tremonti's going to resign. Big problems with the Italian banks. Mm. Italy's core. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and worrying, as you suggested, that it's come on the radar screen uh, this week. Mm. Uh, action, supposedly, preemptive action. We'll see if it can be carried through politically. Uh, but that uh, would be another a worrying and, and, and very uh, dangerous phase. I guess we'll know more about the Italian banks, hopefully, by, by the end of next week after yeah. the stress test results. So. Which we're assured are going to be much more stringent. A lot. Yeah. A lot, mm. a lot, a lot. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Nick, thank you very much. No uh, Nick Beecroft, Senior Markets Consultant at Saxo Bank. Uh, an amazing day for euro dollar. Just look at the kind of uh, activity we've seen. As you can see, uh, we weakened this morning uh, as we grow, grew more and more concerned about what is happening surrounding Italy, the unit credit suspension, etc., etc. All of that dragging the single currency lower. Then we got the non-farm payroll pop as the euro strengthened. And now we're starting to weaken again. Tom Levinson is going to explain exactly what all of this activity means. He joins us now from ING Financial Markets. Quite a day. Yeah, I think really uh, sheer confusion in the markets, really trying to counterbalance what's going on in the Eurozone and what's going on in the US. Of course, in the Eurozone, it's the banking side of things, the ongoing fiscal crisis, and in the US, a real reality check in terms of the economic recovery, or, or rather, I guess, the extension of this now quite long soft patch. Does this give you a new target for the euro dollar, Tom? I mean, it was a pretty substantial correction in the non-farm payroll data. Not particularly. We've got a 150 target for euro dollar uh, by the end of this year, and that really is based on the fact that we expect a materially stronger performance from the U.S. economy in the second half of this year. Now, no, now doubt, no date. Uh, the number that we had today was poor, um, but we do expect the momentum to pick up through the second half of this year. And if we do get, say, a, a bullish steepening of the U.S. yield curve and those longer-term yields moving back higher then we do think that does suggest that euro dollar would move higher and we do still stick to a 150 target. Yeah, I got a lot of curve flattening today. Tom, what do I do if I'm Switzerland? What do I do if I'm Norway? Because I have to say, as I go into this weekend, I'm thinking that the problems of the eurozone are getting worse. And as you say, the soft patch in the States is turning into quite an unpleasant bog. I think the Swiss franc risks further upside. Of course, it's record highs at the moment already. Uh, it really seems to do well either way. You get good eurozone economic data, and Switzerland's plugged into Germany, it does well. If the Eurozone fiscal side of things and the banking sector is struggling, 
then Switzerland's also a safe haven. So Swiss upside, Nokia as well, I think that's doing well too, possibly going to break up to the upside. And really, the Norwegian krona is a good alternative to any other European FX out there. Tom, I still think it's curious in terms of today's reaction that we saw this dollar rally ahead of the data and then a big drop after the data, but we're kind of back to the levels we were at before the data was released now. In other words, we're back to kind of, I guess, well, we're back to levels, to the levels we were at before the data, as just said, but, but we're also back to maybe not having it be a sustainable switch in terms of how people are thinking about things. Yeah, I think there you have the confusion. When you get data that's so bad as the payrolls that we had today, then the market automatically kind of moves towards risk aversion, uh, taking risk off the table, and of course the dollar is still the ultimate safe haven out there, even if, the, even if the bad data is coming out of the US. But if you then take the view that, yes, this is a bad number, but US momentum will pick up, yes, it'll be slow, but we, we're given confidence by the fact that the Fed will keep rates near zero, and that will you know, really foster risk conditions, and maybe there's reasons to go and sell the dollar again and move into more risky assets. So, I think that confusion continues to pervade the markets and our preference right now is that a gentle recovery in the US economy and Fed keeping rates near zero is a negative influence for the dollar into year end. Yeah, Tom, thank you very much. Tom Levinson, Forex strategist at ING Financial Markets and incidentally the dollar seemingly hitting a, a session high for the day now after this data. But anyway, a lot of confusion as, as Tom said. Coming up here in Closing Bell, Atlantis is poised to power into history when it propels towards the heavens on the last ever mission of the 30-year-old U.S. space shuttle program. We will be talking more about this and uh, hopefully also following live what, uh, what takes place uh, in, uh, uh, in the U.S. here in a couple of minutes. Welcome back. You're looking at live pictures from Cape Canaveral. We now understand that it is a go for launch for the space shuttle. We are expecting that in around 26 minutes, 20 seconds. A day, 30 years in the making. An incredible piece of history about to happen. An incredible journey, not only for NASA, but for everybody on this planet. We will watch these pictures as this aircraft takes off. We'll watch them come back. A sad day for many, a great day for some. It really is quite incredible, this piece of technology, and the fact that it's delivered so much, I think, is quite, quite fantastic. It's the 135th uh, launch, and the, final, and the final launch as well. Uh, but it also means, essentially, that now the Americans are handing this mission over to the Russians, that the Russians, they'll be the only ones to, to be able to send astronauts into space. And Obama said, well, we want to try to focus on stuff we haven't done before, like explore Mars, for an example. To reach out beyond near Earth and to go beyond that I think is a big step. Certainly NASA's got its uh, hands full with that one, but it'll be interesting to see whether or not the private companies can step up to the plate and deliver the kind of technology they're promising at the moment to be able to send people to the uh, International Space Station. As you say, the Russians are going to be the only ones servicing that. Fewer people on this space shuttle, of course, because another one isn't standing by on the launch pad. If there were to be a problem, there would be no rescue operation without the Russians. So a lot going on here. We'll continue to watch. But in the meantime, we need to talk about the markets. The non-farm payroll number, a shocker today. The markets have been pricing it in. Let's go to the Nasdaq and find out the story from Manhattan. Hi there. I always wish I was an astronaut. What a cool job, right? Kind of a sad day to see that space shuttle go up for the last time. But anyways, back to the markets. Unfortunately, we are seeing right across the board, like you mentioned, that non-farm payroll number, very disappointing. Looks like we only added about 18,000 jobs. Economists had been expecting much more. That private sector payroll number yesterday was much stronger than we had expected. So today was sort of a, an even bigger surprise, perhaps, than had we not got such a nice number in that private sector payroll yesterday. So nevertheless, we had some downward pressure already coming into today's trade. I want to start off talking about Google. Google getting, getting a downgrade from Morgan Stanley. They're basically downgrading it to equal rate weight from overweight, also cutting the price target from $645 a share to $600 a share, cutting 2012 EPS estimates. Basically, the analyst is saying they know that they're investing in local e-commerce and social media, 
they're not sure about the return on investment for some of that money being laid out for those um, for those expenditures. Also worried about some margin pressure going forward because of the aggressive hiring. And I also want to talk about Yahoo really quickly. David Einhorn of Greenlight Capital, a big hedge fund here, um, has exited his stake in Yahoo, a stake that he entered just earlier this year, saying he's not really happy with what's been done with some of the Chinese subsidiaries within Yahoo. Back to you. Courtney, good seeing you. Thank you very much. Yeah, indeed. Nice seeing uh, you as well. <laughs> indeed, being a uh, being in a special would be exciting. I'm not sure it's the job for me, guy. Maybe maybe you. Uh, I'd love it. Cool. What well, a great job. <laughs> anyway, I've got my feet firmly on the ground because we need to talk about what's happening with the European stress test. We now know that at 5 p.m. London time, this time next week, we will get the details coming through. The top line will be at 5, 5.30, we'll get the bank by bank details. What we have learned today is, according to Mario Draghi, that the Italian banks will all pass. The German banks are apparently going to all pass as well. Remember, they have to achieve a 5% tier one risk weighted assets throughout the stress testing process be interesting to see who's ultimately going to fail if the Germans and the Italians are all passing. Today the pressure was certainly on Unicredit. We were down by, well, we're down by 7.5% uh, coming into the close here in Europe. Peter Tarr Larson joins us now. He's the assistant editor at Reuters Breaking Views. Peter, they're all going to pass by the sounds of things. Well, it does sound like um, there's a bit of jockeying for position going on. Um, I'm, I'm not actually sure that um, the different countries actually have, have really finalised who's passing and who's failing. Um, and there is this meeting of the European finance ministers next Tuesday, uh, which will discuss sort of some of the sort of the, the provisions that they have to put in place to deal with banks that have failed and how to support them and also to deal with, with banks that have only just passed. Um, but it, it does sound like there's still quite a bit of horse trading going on behind the scenes. Um, and, and the results may be sort of up in the air until the very last minute. Uh, Peter, what should investors be aware of here over the next six days, seven days, up to the actual release of the stress test results? What, what's the key element to look for on Friday? Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, the first thing to say is that these tests are a lot tougher than the tests were last year. Um, the they, they, they've kind of, you know, the, the, the economic scenario is quite tough and, and they have also found ways of sort of making countries acknowledge the possibility that, you know, uh, some of this sovereign debt is not worth as much as it once was. Um, but they still have a big flaw, which is that they don't stress test for uh, a default of a sovereign uh, for those, which, which means that all those bonds that banks hold in their banking books and are not marked to market uh, will not be written down as a result of this. However, I've seen uh, the, the European Banking Authority has put out uh, a very detailed template of the disclosure that it's requiring from all the banks, uh, literally about eight or nine pages of, of very small print, um, which will be coming out presumably from all these 91 banks on the Friday afternoon. Um, and I think what that will allow people to do once they've sort of got their heads around it over the weekend is to crunch their numbers themselves and basically say, OK, we now know who's got the exposures to Greece, who's got the exposures to Portugal, who's got the exposures to Italy, what maturities they have, which book they're held in. And you will then be able to sort of, uh, you know, with the, with the help of a spreadsheet, crunch some numbers and actually do your own stress test on the banks, which I suspect probably will be the real story of these uh, of these results. Peter, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much indeed. Peter Tull Larson joining us from Reuters Breaking Views. The reason we've wrapped that interview up is that we are watching events at Cape Canaveral. That clock should be moving. It's not. We are stuck on 31 seconds at the moment. Uh, let's listen in to uh, ground control, what they're communicating to the space shuttle, and hear exactly where we are in this process. And of course, now we're holding here 31 seconds while we get a verification that the GBA has fully retracted for our pre-plan. This is CMEC. We verify uh, retracted. Okay, and you can verify that it is fully retracted per the, uh, the instructions that we've been uh, that we developed, correct? That's correct. All right, and STE? And NTD, STE concurs. They satisfy the requirements of GSC 13 pre-plan contingency. I am go. Okay, I copy. And launch director. Yes, sir. I heard all that and concur. Press on. All right. Very good. NTDST. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I need concurrence to GLS and mass to clear the hold, please. Very good. And GLS, do you have concurrence? Go. I did that. It's in work. Thank you. Let us know when that's complete.
Okay, it sounds like there has been a, a, a last-minute issue in terms of one of the, uh, the launch right, control devices retracting from the space shuttle itself. Uh, we are waiting to see, once we get final clearance, that that device has acted as it was meant to. I suspect that the countdown will continue, that we'll be back counting down to the final launch of the space shuttle. Um, we are definitely counting down to the close here in Europe. It's been quite a day here in Europe. I just want to highlight some of the stocks that we are watching here. I want to get back to the, uh, the story surrounding the space shuttle as quickly as possible. B-Sky B down by 7.5% today. The reason for that, it is looking increasingly unlikely that we will see an imminent takeover by Rupert Murdoch of this British satellite broadcast. Uh, he already owns some of it, of course, but he is now, given what is happening with the phone hacking scandal, looking increasingly unlikely to be able to execute that deal anytime soon. Let's take a quick look at some of the other stocks we're watching as well. Uh, we've got Trinity Mirror had a very good day. This is a competitor to um, the, uh, the News of the World uh, grouping, uh, and as a result of which the stock has done well today. There have been further developments on this front today. Uh, and I just want to quickly show you of a, a... Oh, no, here we go. All the space the engines up and burning. Go for launch. Two, one, zero, and lift off. The final lift off of Atlantis on the shoulders of the space shuttle. America will continue the dream. The program, Houston. Roger roll, Atlantis. Houston now controlling the flight of Atlantis. The space shuttle spreads its wings one final time for the start of a sentimental journey into history. 24 seconds into the flight, roll program complete. Atlantis now heads down, wings level on the proper alignment for its eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Four and a half million pounds of hardware and humans taking aim on the International Space Station. 40 seconds into the flight, the three liquid fuel main engines throttling back to 72% of rated performance in the bucket, reducing stress on the shuttle as it goes transonic for the final time. Engines now revving up, standing by for the throttle up call. from Capcom Barry Wilmore, a transducer, instrumentation only, no action required. Atlantis now 15 miles in altitude, already 16 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, one minute, 40 seconds into the flight. Atlantis flexing its muscles one final time. Atlantis traveling almost 2,600 miles an hour, 21 miles in altitude, 24 miles downrange. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Booster officer confirms staging a good solid rocket booster separation. Guidance now converging. The main engine steering the shuttle on a pinpoint path to its preliminary orbit. Two minutes, 20 seconds into the flight. Atlantis already traveling 3,200 miles an hour, 35 miles in altitude, 50 miles downrange. The propulsion officer reports the orbital maneuvering system engines have ignited. Atlantis kicking on its afterburners for one minute, 23 seconds for the final phase of powered flight. Atlantis, two engine towel. Exciting stuff. Extremely. Very, very exciting stuff. Uh, we have had a successful launch thus far of the Space Shuttle Atlantis, the final flights of the Space Shuttle program. 30 years we have been watching those scenes. There have been disasters along the way, of course, but you can't help but take your hat off what has been an incredibly successful, if not expensive, program over that period. And, and now looking to instead explore Mars, as we were talking about, uh, yeah. and, and also um, asteroids. Do more uh, asteroid research and things like that, apparently. Yeah. 
it's sort of exciting things to you look You don't know what's to. out there, right? So. <laughs> okay, let's pick up and talk about how the European markets have closed down. Remember that it has been an incredibly tumultuous week for the equities. Uh, we have dipped back below the 6,000 mark on the London market today. We're down by 1%. It's been the banks that have really done the damage today. Uh, we have seen, to a certain extent, miners come off as well, but it really has been the banks that have been in the centre of the story. Uh, the SMI down by 9 tenths of 1%. The Cancaron trading down by 1.6%. The Zetra Dax with stocks like Commerce Bank very much under pressure, down by 9 tenths of 1%. The closing price on the Zetra Dax, 74.03. Coming up right here on Closing Bell After Hours, the Murdoch media saga continues as other newspapers are raided by police. Uh, more on that after the break. Of course, our guest host joins us imminently as well. So much more to come. Hi, welcome back. You are watching a Closing Bell After Hours, where we've just seen the closing of our European markets and we saw uh, quite a bit of red across our screens. The FTSE 100, though, flat to slightly higher towards the end of, of the session. That, that's, that's interesting. The week. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, that is the week. Uh, that will make a lot more sense given the, uh, the non farm payroll data that was so weak. I, I didn't think it would manage to recover, but yeah, on the week, FTSE flat to, uh, well, flat. Zetra DAX, CAC 40, and the SMI on the week all off by between, what, a half percent and uh, two and a half percent. David Kuhl joins us. He is uh, our guest host for the hour, director at The Motley Fool. David, uh, we've had awful data. We have the stress test coming up next week. We've had the ECB hiking rates. We have questions now about another round of quantitative easing in the U.S. Um, are you still feeling optimistic? Of course I feel optimistic. I mean, you only have to look at the figures and you think, right, this is a buying opportunity because you know that uh, America, the bad payroll numbers means that America will have to pump more money into the system because ultimately there is an election coming up and you need that feel good factor in America. So therefore, I think Ben Bernanke has already said there will be no slowdown on my watch. So therefore, that means pumping more money into the system. If you pump more money into the system, it means that it's going to be inflationary, which therefore means that it is good for the stock market. In a nutshell, that is my take on it. In right. a nutshell. Mm. David, we'll have more from you here throughout the rest of the show. Uh, email us if you have questions or comments, uh, European Closing Bell at CNBC.com or find us on Twitter. Now, the Murdoch media crisis is apparently spreading to other newspapers. This after police this afternoon have confirmed in the UK that they are now searching the offices of the Daily Star newspaper. Earlier, Andy Coulson, the former communications chief for David Cameron, was arrested. He is, of course, the former editor of the News of the World. Um, speaking earlier in a press conference, the UK Prime Minister defended his decision, though, to employ the man. I'm not hiding from the decision I made. I made the decision. There'd been a police investigation. Someone had been sent to prison. This editor had resigned. He said he didn't know uh, what was happening on his watch, but he resigned when he found out, and I thought it was right to give that individual a second chance. Now, people will be able to judge whether that was the right thing or the wrong thing to do. Yeah, and of course, uh, Rebecca Brooks uh, really at, at the forefront of all the talk now, whether or not she is going to have to leave her job. Uh, she, she's, it's been all over the media. Yeah. Uh, as we've been talking about. Uh, CNBC's Kayla Tosh had tracked down Mr. Murdoch yesterday. She's in Sun Valley still uh, with, with the latest as well. Kayla, uh, speculation about whether or not Murdoch is going to continue to support Rebecca Brooks so far. He's been very adamant that her leadership skills are good enough uh, and, uh, and that he's confident in, in her managing uh, abilities as well and her ethical skills as well. Um, in terms of what he had to say to you yesterday and what we've found out over the next or over the past 24 hours, has anything changed stateside? You know, all Murdoch would say to us is that he was standing by the statement that he made where he said he was standing by Rebecca Brooks. Nothing really has changed. And it's interesting because this scandal is huge, but we're on this very Augustine, uh, very tranquil estate a mile wide here in Idaho. The top two executives at News Corp are here. But the, the 
media here, the moguls here, have sort of shifted gears. They said it's a shocking and it's surprising that they did decide to shut our news with the world, but that the fallout that we've gotten in the last 24 hours is due course from allegations that have been outstanding for quite some time. And you can imagine that here in the U.S., those very, very dismal non-farm payroll numbers that we got this morning have really caught everyone's attention. So there's been sort of a, a shift from the focus on news of the world yesterday. You know, a lot of people, a lot of eyeballs were earned by that story. Today, we're sort of shifting to the broader economy and saying, you know, what's the jobs picture like? Murdoch, that situation will solve itself. Uh, uh, can I just, I, I, the non-farm payroll number obviously front and center, Kayla, but I, you only had to watch the British media last night and I have to say you were all over it and on the front pages of a number of British papers today. Um, but the sense here is that Murdoch is not handling this well that the Murdoch organization is behind the curve, that it is getting this wrong, that the shuttering of the newspaper is simply not going to be enough to silence the critics and get the B-Sky B deal back on track. Is there a sense amongst those senior executives there that Murdoch is losing his touch? That's not really something that we can tell at this point. James Murdoch and his wife were supposed to be in attendance at this conference here in Sun Valley, and he is not. He's back in London, as we know, doing damage control on this situation, trying to get in front of the ball as much as he can. Rupert has been a no-show today. We think we might have seen him get out of a car wearing a white baseball cap this morning. He was wearing a white baseball cap yesterday as well, but we haven't been able to track him down uh, today. We do understand that he has been attending panels. He has been listening to uh, the information that's presented here at the Allen Company conference as if it were business as usual. I imagine he has had to duck out for quite a few phone calls or emails. But as far as the damage control day to day on this situation, we understand that's being handled by James Murdoch and that Rupert is still in attendance. He and his wife Wendy are premiering a movie here in Sun Valley this afternoon. So it's not likely that he will be leaving here before that happens. And that's really what we know at this point. Okay, we'll wrap it up there. Keep enjoying it. Looks like you are. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, I just want to bring up the, this issue of the Daily Star because it now looks as if the newspaper story is beginning to widen a little bit beyond the, the news of the world, beyond the world of Murdoch, um, because it's understood, and this has been reported by a number of media outlets in the UK this afternoon, that the Daily Star, another red-top tabloid newspaper, has had its offices searched by the police and that a number of boxes of material were removed. Now, it's very interesting. This organization is run by the media mogul Richard Desmond. CNBC recently ran a profile piece of Mr. Desmond. He talks uh, about a number of subjects in that interview. We had an event surrounding it. Now, what is interesting here is that Mr. Desmond recently withdrew his organization from the UK PCC, the Press Complaints Commission, he stopped making payments to that. And it was interesting because he was asked about that and the reaction of Jeremy Hunt, the media secretary here in the UK, and the concerns that Mr. Hunt has about this uh, withdrawal. Uh, and, and I'm just going to quote now from a Media Week piece uh, that was written following that event uh, because he was asked about his withdrawal from the, uh, the PCC and whether or not that would bring statutory regulation quite a step closer. Um, he, he was asked the question, he thought about it, uh, and, and I'm quoting here, he whispers in a response that is nonchalant and inflammatory as it is perhaps poignant, quote, because I don't want to be with a bunch of expletive phone hackers. This story has got legs. It is going to go much further. Uh, I'm not sure it necessarily will go further in this direction. But as Louisa says, the issue of Rebecca Brooks remains front and centre. And I suspect the phone hacking story certainly will not be missing from the front pages of the British newspapers and the media for really quite some time. No. Um, I mean, David, it, it's pretty extraordinary. Uh, and it's pretty extraordinary the developments that have happened here over the past couple of days. It is a story that's been rolling for a long time, the phone hacking story in the UK. Do you think that we will end up seeing a deal going through between B-Sky-B and, and News Corp? Have they sacrificed now news of the world in order to make sure that this deal goes through? I think it's pretty obvious they have sacrificed news of the world. But in the investing world, we have something called the cockroach theory of investing. Are you familiar with this at all? 
We're filling it with cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> well, precisely. The thing is, wherever you see one cockroach, there must be many more out there. Yeah. And I think this is what is happening now, that the, uh, the investigation is being widened. They're having a look to see where else there are cockroaches. Can I, can I just ask you, th th there was a very strong reaction in some of the other newspaper shares today going up. Yes. Which I was surprised about. And I have to say that, that looking at Twitter and various other things, that a lot of people were surprised about that as well. And for the simple reason that what is going to happen here is that the regulatory environment, so just pulling out that, that piece that I just quoted there, the regulatory environment is going to get tougher here. We're moving towards a much more onerous regulatory environment, statutory regulation. We're not going to be self-policing these organizations anymore. That's going to be bad for shareholders. Costs are going to go up. We know what's happened with the banks. Isn't this a similar story for the media? Well, I disagree because I think, you know, what people want to do is to be able to read a newspaper and know what they're actually reading in there has been obtained legally. But from and a shareholder point of view, well, it's going to raise costs. Oh, oh, well, on a shareholder point of view, look at Trinity Mirror today. I mean, the shares are up 4%. And if you have a look at the valuation of Trinity Mirror, it's on a P of about sort of two, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is almost as cheap as chips at the moment. And even if you add in things like the debt and the pension, it's still on a P of about six. I mean, I would be out there buying those shares because I would think, hey, you know, that, that's a good punt. David, we'll come back. We'll yeah. have more from you in a moment. Uh, coming up, though, on Closing Bell After Hours, the world-famous Joel Stainton. He's here. He'll be charting German CDS. Well, he is world-famous. He's I, on I, CNBC, I, I, right? Of course. <laughs> he'll be charting the, uh, the German CDSs versus the two and the tens. Uh, also on employment, and he'll be doing that in just a couple of minutes. analysis time. Welcome back. Joel Stainton. He is head of research and trading strategy from SCB Futures. Hi, Joel. Hello. Um, German CDSs versus the twos and the tens. Who's leading who here? Well, we think the CDS is leading. Uh, the white line is the twos, tens yield curve, the spread between the, uh, the two benchmark yields in, in Europe. This is German, German bonds. And normally when a central bank raises rates, that would flatten. Normally the, the two-year yields rise relative to the ten-year yields. That should be what's happening now, and through some of the year it is. However, what we're showing here is a correlation with the German CDS. And the reason we've done that is because the message from the ECB reiterated yesterday is that the, to save the periphery is going to cost the core, i.e. Germany, a lot of money. Trichet basically told the periphery, you need to act like Germany, and he told Germany, you need to support them. And that's going to cost them money. And whenever we get news like that, the German CDS will tend to rise, just as it did at the end of last year when Portugal and Ireland were having difficulties. And when it rises, the yield on long-term German debt will also rise. And so that's why the two tens curve will steepen, despite the fact that the ECB are raising rates. We've actually got the point now where the two-year yield is below the three-month yield, which normally only happens when the market expects rate cuts. Two years below the three-month yield. Yep. Okay. Uh, we had an atrocious non-farm payroll data uh, figure out of yep. the U.S. this afternoon. You're looking at employment as well? Maybe. This is the duration of unemployment. Yeah, the, the headline number, as you say, was atrocious. And unfortunately, it wasn't just the headline number. Um, the employment to population ratio, that's something the Fed look at. That's at the low since the 1980s. Um, the, you know, there's a number of measures within this data which is really poor. And it's becoming structural. You know, youth unemployment in America is close to 20%. Um, is it it, yeah, it's, it's really uh, you know, becoming a structural problem, really exemplified by this chart. We're going all the way back to the 1940s here. This is the number of weeks that an American spends on average unemployed, or an unemployed American spends unemployed. We're up to 40 weeks. This is double double any other recession and so this shows you know Bernanke talks about the the painful recovery and how slow it is that the unemployment is coming down the U6 measure of unemployment that's the measure of people who consider themselves unemployed that went up nearly half a percent in June that went up to 16.2 percent so in other words it, it really is it taking really a long is time. a big yeah, problem yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, briefly short sterling mm. Short sterling, despite all the bad news, the market is priced for bad news. In the UK here, this is the calendar spread between December this year and June next year. So this is the number of rate hikes priced for the first half of 2012. It's down to just 15 basis points. That's as close to zero as we're going to get in a six-month run. And yet pay deals came in at 3.3% in June. That's the bit that the Bank of England said they would be worried about, pay deals. So we think the time is right to start putting on some bets that rates will have to rise first half of next year. Joel, world famous Joel Stainton, thank you very thank much. You. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
the weekend. Formula One heading to Silverstone on Sunday for the British Grand Prix. The season has so far, of course, been dominated by one man driving a Red Bull car, Mr. Vettel, winning six out of the last eight races to date. Uh, the sport, though, making headlines following, of course, the cancellation in Bahrain. But we've also had some fairly significant changes to the cars and the way that they operate. Ross has been having a bit of fun. He went trackside to find out exactly what has been going on and what has kept the drivers and the team focused this season. It's the halfway point in the Formula One season and at McLaren's swanky headquarters in Surrey, fans and teams have been discussing the progress of the sport this year, one that never stands still. A lot has changed, of course, since this car was on the track in the 80s. This year, big changes include new Pirelli tyres that degrade very quickly and a rear wing that opens up to enable overtaking. So how much difference has this made? I think with the wing system, um, that gives, you can see, a lot of overtaking opportunity. Tyres have been um, uh, a revelation and that adds a lot to the race, a lot to the strategy. The DRS makes it quite a, a, a lot easier uh, to get closer to people. You know, it was very, very difficult to follow people and then, and then by the time you slipstream them, you're, you're, you know, you're at the next corner. It's much easier to overtake. We have more chance to overtake. But some planned changes are proving controversial. New 1.6-litre V6 turbo engines will replace the current V8 engines from 2014. It's all part of F1's efforts to show that it's doing its bit for the environment. Critics, including rights holder Bernie Eccleston, says the quieter sounding engines could dull the experience. Others disagree. It will still sound impressive and the cars, of course, will still go very, very quickly. It's going to send out an important message about the sport that it knows how to embrace uh, you know, a, a more environmentally responsible, if you like, from an engine point of view, future. But in Woking, the question for McLaren is whether a new engine will help the team get back to the top of the podium. We've won over 25% of the Grand Prix. We've been on the podium for more than 50% of the races since 67 when we came into this sport. Those are statistics which we're proud of, but we have to defend and we've got to make sure that we win as many as we can. That starts on Sunday, when British fans hope either Lewis Hamilton or Jensen Button can bring a home victory at Silverstone. So we're off to the races this weekend to Silverstone. What's going to be off to the races in terms of the markets? Top tips? Well, I do have some top tips. I want to draw an analogy between F1 racing and the regulators. You know, the F1 racing, they keep on putting on these new onerous rules. Yeah. They say the diffusers have to change. And what happens? Every year it gets faster and faster. They get around it. Well, exactly. They do get round it. So as far as the banking regulations are concerned, we will get round Well, not we will get round it, but they will get round it somehow. They will work around those rules. You don't think... Are you I, I agree with that. There's some very smart people out there. But nevertheless, the, the problems that are happening in the banking world seem to be so oppressive at the moment. Yeah. And that's reflected in share prices. Like They're trading on, on book value. They are. But the thing is, I mean, this is a buying opportunity. I mean, can you see the day when we don't have HSBC, when we don't have Barclays Bank? Mm. Impossible, I don't. It is like you read the mind of Aaron, a, a regular viewer. He writes in and says, buying opportunity, if I was bullish on equities yesterday, and I was, one bad jobs report can't change that, can it? Well, it can't change that. And you have to sort of look beyond all of that and say, is the world going to be a better place in five years' time? compared to today and I think the answer most people will say it is so therefore if you are a long-term stock investor you should be buying shares now well, unless you have the beginning of a banking meltdown yeah the problem is that what else do you earn right now you've got a bunt that's yielding 2.8 this evening I anything below three percent a lot of senior investors will tell you is not worth owning I what do you own in this kind of world right now? Well, you own shares that are going to pay you a decent dividend. You're going to look for things that are going to pay you more than four and a half, five percent, which is what the CPI and the RPI figures are telling you. Inflation is running at five percent. It's going to get even higher than that. There are high yielding stocks out there. You should be looking at those stocks and say, I want to buy some of those. The likes of Vodafone, GlaxoSmithKline, these are the shares that are going to do well. Are they going to be around in five years' time? Yes, they are. Are they going to be increasing their dividends year on year? Yes, they are. So therefore, why aren't you buying them? So you tell me. I have more time on arguing with you about Vodafone, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> David, lovely seeing you. Have a, have a fantastic weekend. Thank David Kuo, director at The Motley Fool. That's it for closing, Bill.
Coming up next here on CNBC, the strategy session, we're going to continue to debate, debate that 18K read on non-farm payrolls. Oh, definitely. And of course, stress tests exactly a week from now on, on uh, next Extended Friday. Extended programming for that, I yeah. tell you, here on CNBC.